It is my great pleasure and privilege to be here today with Father Angelus Shaughnessy, a Capuchin from the St. Augustine province based in Pittsburgh. And Father Angelus is going to speak to us today about how the Holy Spirit has been at work in his life, drawing him into his vocation and even in his priestly ministry. I'd just like to start us off with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God, loving Father, out of love for us, you have called us each by name. You have loved us from the moment of our creation, hidden within our mother's wombs. You have called us forth into life, and you have given us each a special mission to love you, to follow you, to serve you. Father, I thank you for Father Angelus and the mission that you have given him and the many lives, the many hearts that you have touched through his ministry. Father, I beg you to anoint his words to us today. And I beg you to pour your Holy Spirit also into the hearts of all of our listeners that they may hear a special word from you through the witness of Father Angelus, that each of us may be strengthened in grace and deepened in our resolve to follow after you. We ask this and all things through the intercession of Our Lady. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Francis, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I'm an octo-friar now. That means I'm an octogenarian, 80 years old. Not much to show for it, though. But I have the consolation of what Father Mark from the Eternal Word Television Network said one day when I mentioned that to him, not much to show for these years. He said, there's something to be said for fidelity. That is a consolation. And I have been faithful, too. This is the 60, 60th year of our profession. We were professed on July the 14th, 1950, at St. Peter's and Paul's Monastery in Cumberland, Maryland. The place that was a residence for Blessed Francis Xavier Salos and Bishop John Neumann. That's where we made our novitiate under Father Peter Homan. I've really been blessed with so many things, especially with my family. I come from a large family. I had seven sisters and four brothers. My mom had three sets of twins, Paul and Pauline, Joe and Josephine, Bernard and Bernadette. Only six of us left. And I was baptized Matthew. Do you know what Matthew means in Hebrew? gift of God. And I was. I cut the diaper load right in half after two sets of twins, Paul and Pauline and Joe and Josephine. In our house, the faith was alive. And I'm convinced that the grace of a vocation to the service of the church, priesthood, brotherhood, sisterhood, diaconate, is a gift given not so much to an individual in the ordinary plan and providence of God, as it is given to a family. Oh, of course, there are exceptions to that. But in our case, I think it was the rule. The faith was alive. We prayed together each night, except Saturday night. I guess we were anticipating Sunday, back in the days of the pre-Vatican experience. But every other night we prayed together, unless there was evening devotions at St. Cecilia's Church in Rochester, Pennsylvania, where we grew up. Sunday night was rosary, litany, and benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. Tuesday evening was St. Anthony and St. Conrad devotion, 
with benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. And we, we were expected to be there. Only lasted a half hour. But what a grace that was. But on Saturday night, we were free. We were supposed to be getting organized for Sunday Mass, even though ever since I made my first Holy Communion, I have been to Mass every day. And I think that's how I got some encouragement from my father. He's the one who got up earlier than Mom, and he made our breakfast for us. And for me especially, he packed my breakfast because at that time, you had to fast from midnight to receive Holy Communion at Holy Mass, and Mass was at 8 o'clock in the morning. He always packed me two egg sandwiches, two donuts, and an orange. And that was special. Of course, Mom needed her rest, but she went to Mass every day after the youngest one was in school. She was a real believer. A no-nonsense German girl. She was born in Germany. Came over to this country when she was six months old. And she was tough. I guess she had to be with the likes of what was in our family. But my dad loved her dearly. I thought she got away with so much. And she knew how to relax, too. She told me once that she always felt good that particular day if she knew she was going out to play cards that night. And she was a great card player, 500 in bridge, and she could remember, she could count. She always came home with prizes, too. And some of these very sophisticated people. Mom was on my case a lot when I was young. I had my first conversion when I was in the fourth grade. I'll never forget it. Remember, I'm 10 years of age. I bought a pipe, a corn cob pipe. I paid 35 cents for it. Now, that was a fortune in the days of the Depression. And I, I bought a pack of a pipe tobacco, too. I know exactly where I hid it, in that empty lot where we used to play tackle football at the corner of Connecticut Avenue and Reno Street in Rochester, right next to Petty Bonds Dairy. And that high grass, that's where I hid it, because I knew if I brought it home, they would probably find it, and then I would really, really be in trouble. But then I went to confession. Now, I knew the Fourth Commandment, but I didn't know the Fifth Commandment too well, maybe, at the age of 10. Because the Fifth Commandment says you have to take care of your health, and you, if you're smoking, you should not be smoking. But I knew the Fourth, honor thy father and thy mother. I think they would have killed me, at least Mom would have, if they ever caught me. So if I went to confession and wasn't willing to give up smoking, I knew that sin wouldn't be forgiven because... We have to make the firm purpose of amendment, that contrition that looks to the future, meaning with God's help, I'm not going to commit that sin again. That's when I turned. What a grace that was. I would have been dead 20 years ago if I had kept smoking like that. That was a very, very special grace. And it was the church articulating the moral demands of our God that made that so clear to me to those dear sisters who taught us in elementary school the Sisters of Divine Providence. I always thought they were clones of my mother. Really, also, no-nonsense people. I remember them all. Every single one of them. Sister Georgiana in the first grade. Sister Alfreda in the second. And she was the most enthusiastic teacher I ever had in my life. Man or woman. She prepared us for our first Holy Communion with an enthusiasm that was hard to equal by anybody in this world. And I was in a position to pay her back, too. When she got ill with cancer of the bone, and she was in Allegheny General Hospital in Pittsburgh on the north side, and I was home from New Guinea at that time where I was a missionary, and they told me she was in pretty bad shape. So I went over from my little mass kit and offered Holy Mass for her twice in her room on different occasions before I went back to Papua New Guinea. I wasn't there when she died, though. This was my own personal way to pay back to this dear sister who really explained the Eucharist so well, according to the mentality of a little seven-year-old. In the third grade, we had four sisters. I guess we were pretty tough on some of them. Sister Agnes Clara, Sister Mary Cletus, Sister Hildegard, and uh, they brought in a sister of the Holy Spirit 
from the North Hills of Pittsburgh, Sister Christine. Fourth grade, Sister Agrita. She just went into eternal life. My fifth grade teacher, Sister Francine, is still living and still working for the church, for the kingdom of God. I still remember her motto, too. Stop, look, and listen when Sister speaks. And we did. I don't think she could have been much more than a teenager when she was first teaching us, but she had authority and no difficulty controlling those 54 students in our classroom. And some of those fellows were pretty big, too, in the fifth grade. Sixth grade, Sister Mary Anthony went blind before she died. Seventh grade, Sister Mary Nicholas, whose brother was a bishop in Papua New Guinea. I think she may have wanted us to join the SVDs. That's what her brother was, the Society of the Divine Word. Eighth grade, Sister Alberta. Yes, they backed up our parents. And if Paul would get into trouble in school, Pauline would report it to mom and dad. Same with Joe and Bernard, too. And uh, that's when the parents backed up the teachers and the principals backed up the teachers and the pastor backed up the teachers. It was kind of unity and authority. What a grace that was. We didn't get any mixed signals. And then the special grace in the sixth grade when I thought, really, maybe I could become a priest. And the key issue for me then and for now is the grace to offer the Mass. I remember when I sprained my ankle playing basketball when I was in high school on vacation, and we came home from the seminary for a couple of weeks at Christmas time and Easter time and about three months in the summertime. We were playing, I sprained my ankle. I went to see the chiropractor because I knew him a little bit. I saw his name out in front of his place there, Dr. Great on Connecticut Avenue. And he dressed my ankle and put me in the right mode to get healed. And he put the question to me one day. He wasn't a Catholic, and I knew that too. He said, why do you want to be a priest? And I gave him the old standard answer that I learned from tender years. I want to save my soul. I want to help save the souls of others. But since that time, and before I even entered the seminary, I think I needed more specificity to that answer. I wanted to offer the Mass, to make the Holy Eucharist so available as to make our God edible. Mm -hmm. We eat our God, not in the cannibalistic form of a former Papua New Guinea where they ate human flesh, and they did, but in the unbloody way he gave himself to us the night before he died. That's why I became a priest. That's why I stay a priest. Everything else in my life is rather marginal. Yes, we hear confessions sometimes for hours on end. Sometimes we talk to people and catechizing them. But the whole purpose of our efforts is to bring them to the Eucharist worthily. Some people define history as man's quest for food. I always liked that definition, having spent 21 years of my head in history books. Man's quest for food, that's what history is. Religious people define history as man's quest for God. That's what we say in Christian philosophy. But in Christian theology, that changes. History is God's quest for man. He wants us, he loves us. And all of these definitions come together in the Holy Ghost. History is God's quest for man. It's man's quest for God who has made him himself available unto the form of bread and wine. That's why my whole priestly life, now 55 years, I've offered Mass every day, even in my travels. I really believe. And I've always tried to, to make a decent Thanksgiving after Holy Communion, as we were taught by Sister Alfreda Bressler in the second grade. About 10 or 15 minutes, if I can. In imitation of John Paul II, when he had his private masses in his special oratory there in Rome, when he was the Holy Father, about 20, 25 people could come to that. Do you know what he would do? He would sit down after communion, before the dismissal, 
and pause in prayer for 10 solid minutes. If any parish priest would try to do that, I think there'd be letters within the hour sent to the bishop that Father's not staying awake during the liturgy. But you know, the Lord is right within us at that moment for as long as the species remain. And in a good, normal, healthy stomach, it's still about 10 or 15 minutes. I put that question to a, a doctor in New York that I knew pretty well. He has a doctor's degree in histochemistry, the chemistry of human tissue and human anatomy from the University of Chicago. And his MD is from the University of West Virginia. He's a very, very bright man. He's a daily communicant too. And I ask him, doctor, how long would a normal sized host remain in his stomach before it's not identifiable as a host like that anymore? He took my question seriously. And he said, about 15 minutes to a half hour. This doctor was medical examiner in Rockland County for about 30 years. He knows the human frame, living and deceased. I think a good norm to follow would be the advice of Sister Alfreda Bressler, 10 to 15 minutes. Because at that time, you and I have equivalently what the Virgin Mother of God had when she conceived Christ nine months before. But only with Mary, Jesus was within her reproductive organs. With you and with me, he's right within our digestive tract. And if you ever want something from God, that's the time to ask for it. Because when we pray, we don't change God. Our God is absolutely immutable. He cannot be changed. He's pure life, pure act, pure love, trying to invade your soul and mine. So if you ever want something from God, what better timing than when the sacred Eucharistic heart of Jesus Christ rests, lives, and beats right within our own for as long as the species remain. Hmm. Think about that. We got into high school and college. We were trained by the Capuchin Franciscan Fathers. They were also in our home parish at Rochester, Pennsylvania, at St. Cecilia's there, and they were good fellows. But most of them that came to Rochester were tired and retired, having been in the mission some for many years. But when we went to the seminary, we met these young Capuchin Franciscan friars. And boy, what a grace that was. And the classroom, too, they were nobody's fools. They were intelligent. They had studied history and philosophy and languages and mathematics and science. They knew their stuff. So what they did for me was to give a, a rational basis for what I often consider the irrationalization of my dear mom or people in our own family, to give a beautiful defense in logic to the faith that we embrace. And that was a special grace. Some of our best teachers were pretty strict, too. Some would have a test every day. Like Father Cadget and Picus. He went back to his baptismal name of Edward Picus. He's known to many of the people in Pittsburgh. He's in eternal life now. Every day there was a test. He taught us English. There was a spelling test for a whole year every day. Ten new words that you had to learn. He taught us Greek, too. Test every day. And when he gave an examination, it was always called usqueod, up until the class that you just finished. And all the material that went before that, too, you were responsible for. So you couldn't say that in an examination he covered too much material. No. It's like a language. You build it up from the beginning, and you keep in your mind, if you can, all that you've learned. He was a wonderful teacher. And the spiritual director in the seminary at those days was Father Giles Staub from St. Martin's Parish in West End, Pittsburgh. Wonderful spiritual. Twice a week he'd come in to the whole student body and have a special conference. And he was full of wonderful stories about the saints and practical examples. So by the time we got into the divisionate after the second year of college, we were pretty well prepared. Yes, I always thought of the Capuchin Fathers. I watched them in operation in my home parish at St. Cecilia's. They were always so good to the sick and the shut-ins, completely devoted to them. And what a grace that was. We learned a lot from them. And they were always rather humble fellows too, gentle, kind, never puffed up with a sense of their own 
authority, never pompous, never like that. And it's all that personalized with our novice master, Father Peter Homan, from Wheeling, West Virginia. He must have had about 15 classes before us, too. He was good, right to the point. He wasn't intimidated by any of us. He did a beautiful job, I thought. I don't know if you know the Capuchins, too. Well, the Capuchins give the contemplative dimension to the Franciscan charism. In other words, if there's a choice between prayer and work, sometimes they kid us and say, you would choose the prayer rather than the work, <laughs> saying that other people can do the work. But to pray well, it's, it's a good effort, too, if you really, really try. And now, uh, the test of the fruit is very clear to us. We have over 15 canonized saints, many more than the 50 blessed. Right now, we have 80 bishops, and one of them to be consecrated, ordained a bishop next month in Papua New Guinea by the Bill Fay in Kimbe in West New Britain. That's really the territory of the Sacred Heart Fathers. But he's a wonderful, wonderful choice. I think his doctor's degree in Cardinal Newman. So our provincial or vice provincial will go over for that ordination too. But 80 bishops still active in the church and they're being replaced as soon as one dies, the other one step right in. One of them is the Cardinal Archbishop of Boston. Maybe you know that name, Sean Cardinal Patrick O'Malley. And his classmate is the Archbishop of Denver in Colorado, Bishop Chapu. And one of their classmates, there were about 25 in that class too. A third rather famous one was our former provincial father, Paul Cup. So I had them together one day and I asked, put the question to them, why so many great men in one little parish? How did this come about? And they were unanimous. One of their teachers, Father Ronald Lawler, PhD, STD, who loved the church and could really defend the faith so beautifully. What a gift he was to our province. He's gone into eternal life, I think, since 2003. Yeah, we've been blessed with so many of our fellows. And we're very happy about this vocation. I guess the biggest reason why I would opt for the Capuchin Franciscans is because I knew them from tender years and what wonderful confessors they were all through our life. But I, when you join a religious community like the Franciscans, they have a principle, maybe you never heard this word before, it's called itinerancy. Iter itinerus means the journey. This is the thought that nobody stays in one place too long. You get going to another place. It's just the opposite of the good Benedictine fathers where they take that vow of stability. <laughs> they take a vow to stay. <laughs> we take a vow to keep moving. Maybe it's the fear that we might give some example is isn't too Incredible. After a while, I'm not too sure what it is, but they want us to keep moving. And that was a great thing. Give us the opportunity, too, to go overseas. But I'll never forget our ordination. On June the 4th, 1955, in the crypt of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary at the hands of Bishop John McNamara. He was an auxiliary bishop in Washington, D.C., pastor at St. Gabriel's Parish in Northwest at Grant Circle there. He's very close to our community, a very good personal friend of Father Sebastian Miklas. There were 40 of us in that class with different religious communities ordained that particular morning. It was just so precious. It was in the crypt of the shrine, too. They didn't have the superstructure finished. They only started that in 1956. What a magnificent temple of God that is. And right at the end of that ordination ceremony, this is most memorable to me. We went up in front of the bishop for the last time. He took his long bony fingers and pressed the heads of each of us real hard. I thought I was going right through that marble floor. He pressed so hard on my head. And what he said was most special. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. That's why the power of the priest is the power of Jesus Christ himself. 
Jesus did say, who sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. Who sins you shall retain, they are retained. Retain means not to forgive. Therefore, to forgive or not to forgive depends upon a judgment. Who can make a judgment? But a judge, somebody who has an ear to hear. This is why we have and why we keep our regular confession. We put our sins into the ear of another human being who in the name and power of Jesus Christ is able to wipe away perhaps the crusted filth of decades. And I'll never forget what St. Augustine said here. For a priest to restore the life of God to a penitent in confession is a greater achievement than the creation of the world at the beginning of time. Sounds like an exaggeration, doesn't it? Do you know how many celestial bodies our God created at the beginning of time? They've counted them. Two telescopes working in conjunction with each other between Australia and Spain. The latest count, and of course when they get more highly powered telescopes, that count will multiply. The present count is 70 sextillion celestial bodies. That's 70 with 21 zeros behind it. There are more celestial bodies in the universe than are grains of sand on the seashores of our ocean and in the deserts of the earth. But for a priest to restore the life of God to a penitent in confession is a greater achievement than even that. Who sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. What peace that brings to people. That's why our Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI and John Paul II did when they were asked how often we should go to confession. They said, once a month. The best Catholics that I know are among the best ones go no more than once or twice a year. But if you want to keep that sensitivity to God and his expectations, a sensitivity to sin, go to confession frequently. And if you're really interested, too, in gaining a plenary indulgence, the remission and removal of all the temporal punishment due to sin, one of the conditions to gain that plenary indulgence is that you receive sacramental confession. Sure, the state of grace, communion, intention to gain it, prayers for the Holy Father, and no attachment even to one deliberate venial sin, but the sacrament of penance. And the time frame for that it used to be designated as a week before or a week after you want to gain that plenary indulgence. But ever since the Jubilee year, there's a new and different time frame promulgated by the Holy See, And I have the documentation to prove that to the hands of one of our priests, Father Christopher Ringers, who just died a few months ago. The time frame is within 40 days before or within 40 days after. Over that span of 80 days, you must have gone to confession. And this is the church's way to encourage this reception of the sacrament of penance. And I think it's really worthwhile to think about that. See, confession is the greatest preventative of sin before it's committed. Confession is the greatest expiation and satisfaction for sin after a sin might be committed. The greatest evil in the world, though, is not sin. The greatest evil in the world is the denial of sin. Compunction, contrition, sorrow, get rid of sin. But the denial of sin perpetuates the sin, and you and I are the losers in the process. But the ultimate in sin, beyond which is impossible to go, is to call evil good. And isn't that the picture in our culture right now? To call killing babies before they're born, Pro-choice, so these dear folks are in favor of the exercise of free will. And their opponents, the pro-life people, are called anti-choice. Killing us old people off. It's called euthanasia, oithanatos, and good and beautiful death. Death with dignity. Who would not want to die without a pamper or a diaper on? It's new name, though. Death with dignity. Pornography, intrinsically evil, can never, ever be justified. From those two Greek words, poine, which means prostitute, and graphine, which means to depict, to depict the antics of the prostitute. No spouse can compete with the antics of the prostitute. It's new name, though, in our culture of death. Freedom of speech. 
homosexual marriages. An abomination before God. Its new name, alternate lifestyle. And that's how it's taught in our culture of death today. I think our Lord would call it something closer to the abomination of desolation. I don't think it can get any worse than this without the human race dying out. Thank God for the church. The only institution in this world that can save us from the degrading slavery of becoming a child of our age. You remember in the last century, the spirit of the age, communism, Marxism, Nazism, fascism. Their greatest opponent was the Catholic Church. And in this century, it's the culture of death as designated by Benedict XVI, the tyranny of relativism. How sad. As Gilbert Keith Chesterton would say, if he lived on this planet a thousand years, he would be left with but two alternatives. Hopeless skepticism, where you doubt any and everything coming down the pike and never arrive at certitude. Hopeless skepticism and Roman Catholicism. Anything between the two is a compromise. And praise and thank God you and I belong to a church that will not compromise the truth. How blessed we are. And all these popes in my lifetime, Pius XI, Pius XII, John the Twenty Third, Paul the Sixth, John Paul the First, John Paul the Second, Benedict the Sixteenth. Officially, the church is in very, very good shape, and the bishops that I've known in the diocese where I've lived, like in Papua New Guinea, where I spent fourteen years as a missionary, our own Bishop Furman Schmidt, one of our own. Doctor's degree in petrology from Iwanis Kwasin at the University of. Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. And then Huey C. Boyle, Bishop of Pittsburgh. John Cardinal Francis Cardinal Dearden. We trained him to become a cardinal when he went to Detroit. John Wright, Bishop Leonard. John Donald Worrell, Bishop David Zubik, how blessed. In the Diocese too of Washington, Baltimore, where we lived, and all the places. I could never bring myself really to criticize bishops. They have information about people that I have no access to at all. That's why I keep my mouth shut when the criticism of bishops come up. And the priests in my life too, our dear Capuchin fathers too, and the diocesan priests that we've come to help out so often in the Pittsburgh and the Greensburg Diocese over the years. And as we bounce around the countryside now for missions and retreats, that's been a special joy too. So we pray for vocations to the service of the church, for those who are to take the place of those who have already passed into everlasting dwellings. And the Holy Father makes it very clear it is the duty of every Christian parent to pray to God to have at least one of the children called to his service. And then he added, blessed are those Christian parents who accept without fear the vocations of their sons and daughters. I must tell you about my brother, Father Sigmund, Capuchin Franciscan, a missionary in Puerto Rico for 34 years. And for seven years before that, he taught in our seminary in Kansas. He died the day before his 71st birthday in 1994. He had a couple strokes. He was my Barnabas. Do you know that expression, Barnabas? He was the great supporter and encourager of St. Paul. And he was that for me too. A very humble man, great musician too. He played the violin before the Second Vatican Council. In fact, he was the second violinist at the Hay Symphony Orchestra in Kansas as a priest out there. And then after the Second Vatican Council, he took up the guitar. Oh, he played the football, the basketball, and the baseball. He wasn't very good in that. His great sports were boxing. He was the best fighter in our college. Terrific moves. And he, he was never afraid 
to do, try any trick off the board in a swimming pool. The one and a half, the two and a half, the half gainer, the full gainer, try it all. He always practiced with a t-shirt on in case he didn't land in the right way. What a dear man. We still miss him. I know he's the favorite in our family. I guess he's the good priest in our family too. Everybody loves Father Sigmund. He kind of paved the way for me too in the seminary. But I had a lot of prayers from my sister too. She was a sister of divine providence. She taught for 52 years and music on the side. Those dear sisters of divine providence surely got their money's worth out of that girl. When she was up at St. Alphonsus Parish in Springdale, I remember that so well in 1960, she was teaching the sixth grade the classes were so big in the early 60s that they had to divide the classes. Well, she had the morning session so that she could take music students in the afternoon, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday morning. She told me she had 31 pupils in music beside the sixth grade that she taught in the morning. Do you know what that really means? Listening to 15 and a half hours of mistakes. <laughs> she was her mother's daughter. How blessed she was. All my other brothers and sisters were married. I think I counted, and I'm not too accurate about this anymore, the last count was 113 or 115 nieces and nephews, grandnieces and grandnephews. So I guess I should never be lonely. They're all over the United States too, everywhere. But I really thank my parents for all they've been to me and all they've done for me. What a grace it was to have people like them and those dear sisters and the Capuchin Franciscan fathers to help us along. If I don't get to heaven, I cannot blame it on my parents, my family, the Sisters of Divine Providence or the dear Capuchin Franciscan friars. If I go to hell, I'll take full credit for that. But I thank God for this vocation. For the first 10 years of my priesthood, it's really not my priesthood, it's a priesthood of Jesus Christ. We just participate in his priesthood. I was the third order priest. I mean, they call him a secular Francis. For 10 years, I was in charge of the St. Augustine fraternity. Now they call him the spiritual assistant. We had 12 youth fraternities, high school kids and college kids. And one group that combined them all for the youth called the Crusaders of the Poverella, the Cops of Pittsburgh. Wonderful group, and boy, the Pittsburgh kids always did great at our national conventions, wherever we went. And then 14 years in New Guinea, for the first 11 years there in the seminary teaching, and the spiritual director there, and teaching English and religion and Latin. And when Father Benedict got sick, I was even the science teacher too. Wasn't too good at that, but I did my best. And then three years in the mountains, where the people built 15 churches. But since I've been back in this country and joined the comfort of Western Pennsylvania, I've been in mission work with retreats and missions and things like that. And then I went to Alabama to be the guardian, that means the local superior in the Franciscan tradition the guardian for the Franciscan missionaries of the eternal word. I was there for one contract for three years and they asked our provincial if we could renew it for another three. So I spent six years down here. That was a good experience too, as far as reaching people goes. Because in one telecast, you could reach 128 million households worldwide. On the TV, 128 million, but on in the radio and the internet, 237 million households. That's more than St. Paul or maybe all the preachers in the world could reach in a lifetime. What a grace that was. So we tried our best to prepare, and we did. But now, since I'm back from Alabama, listen to this. I'm the now the National Executive Director 
of the arch confraternity of Christian mothers. Isn't that a mouthful? So this organization, the Christian Mothers, was founded in Lille, France in 1850, spread all over Europe, to Germany, to Radisbon. And it came into this country in 1881 with the German Capuchins. And its headquarters for North America is St. Augustine's Church in Pittsburgh. Our father, Burton Roll, had this organization as national executive director for 60 years. And Father Burton is still living. I think he's 93 now, just as alert as he ever was. He was the best golfer in our province, too. He always brought his clubs with him when he traveled to visit the Christian Mother confraternities. And after he left that particular position, Father Lester Knoll took over the job for three years until he went up to St. Vincent's to be the spiritual director at the seminary up there. So I've been in this job for a little over three years, and I think it's a special grace, too, to share the ideals of Christian motherhood with what we have learned over the years, in both hemispheres, too. The whole purpose is to help mothers train their children as good Catholics. Now, that's always been a need in the church, but never more so than now. When there's all the forces are against the family everywhere. We have some wonderful confraternities too. In each fraternity, the pastor or the parish priest is the director of the group. And my job is to go around just to encourage them and try to help them a little bit with some input. We have one of the most beautiful prayer books that's ever been compiled. It's called Mother Love. It was originally written in German, Mutterliebe, translated into English and updated by Father Burton Roll and then later on by Father Lester and Father Bonaventure. And now we still have that available. And our little periodical, maybe something like a newsletter, it comes out every three months. It's called Also Mother Love. If anybody would like to take a look at that, we'd be happy to send them a copy of that. Father Angelus, thank you for uh, an, an amazing, sharing the amazing life that you've lived, many twists and turns. You surely never thought that you would end up where you are now, and I imagine probably not most of the places along the way. Uh, I've, uh, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about how, you're, how you've seen your, your interior life develop with all of these changes and the exterior circumstances, what your, uh, your prayer before the seminary uh, was surely different than your prayer in seminary, different than your prayer as a priest, different than maybe your prayer as a missionary, as a, uh, a spiritual director, as a retreat master, as the director of the Christian mothers. How have you, how have you seen your relationship with our Lord? change over these many years? I never devalue vocal prayer. Those prayers that we learn so well at the knees of our parents. The Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be, the Acts of Faith, Hope, and Love, the Act of Contrition, the Apostles' Creed, the Memorare, the Peace Prayer of St. Francis, I still think they have tremendous value. And also the old prayer books. If you ever see any old prayer books, don't throw them away. If you ever try to write prayer of yourself, you can really appreciate what these authors did to put those prayers together in those prayer books. That's why I've never thrown away a prayer book in my life. It has value for me. Of course, the whole purpose of prayer is to internalize the message, too. To really pray the rosary with the meditations on the mysteries. Those beautiful sections of the life of our God and His precious Mother. You know, the joyful mysteries, the luminous mysteries, the sorrowful mysteries, the glorious mysteries. To try to internalize that message, personalize it to integrate it into your soul, to make the application to your own heart. Where would I be at the crucifixion? What part did I play in that? 
I think this is the only really true way to pray the rosary. Oh, I know there's some people just say Our Fathers and Hail Marys. Formulating a beautiful intention, that's okay too. But if you can, really personalize it. Because the intention is great, but the attention of the mind, the memory, the intellect is so important to bring it right into your own life. So it's part of your being too. But for me to pray well, I know I have to do three things. I have to keep feeding myself with the best in spiritual reading or the best in tapes on radio or what's on television that's worthwhile to get the material I need to talk to God about. It's so important for me. Like the Lectio Divina in certain traditions, the scriptures. Yes. Maybe as a province, we don't pause too much in our prayers, but I think we have to do it at the time of our meditation. We have two meditations each day set aside in the morning and evening, too. I really try to be faithful to them, even if I'm walking outside in the dark when the weather's not too cold. But first of all, you have to get that input. Secondly, we must be prepared to make the sacrifice that God is asking of us. Until we make that sacrifice that he's asking, we'll never pray, but at a very superficial level. The prayer will never get into the marrow of our bones. If you want to know the sacrifice he's asking of you and me at this very moment, give yourself five minutes to live. You're going to kill over dead here in five minutes. What is it right now that you and I are clutching, that we know for sure we would have to dump in order to embrace him and his will completely. Of course, the big temptation here is to keep postponing that. <laughs> oh, I'll come to the Lord when he dies, <laughs> when these kids get out of the house, when we get a new pastor, when the new bishop comes. Oh, I'll come to the Lord when they're taking me in the ambulance to the nearest hospital emergency. Don't be overly presumptuous. You may not have the consciousness at that time to make that choice for the Lord. And besides, when that oxygen mask is over your nose and your mouth, your choices are only twofold, to breathe or not to breathe. Now when our choices are many and we choose the Lord and his will, that's the sign of a generous heart. And our God is never, ever outdone in generosity. So it's giving yourself the input that's necessary. Keep feeding yourself. Don't worry about selfishness here. This is legitimate self-love. There's a big distinction between selfishness and legitimate self-love. When I take care of my own needs, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, if I give myself the time and the space to pray, I'm really fulfilling the command of my God. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. You have to do that. Make the sacrifice God is asking of you. That's number two. And number three, try to stay in the presence of God all day long, even outside the time of formal prayer. Maybe best of all, with use of those little aspirations, like, Mary, please help me at the time of temptation, or at the moment of decision making, come, Holy Spirit, come. Or when the temptation comes to be aggravated by people or circumstances, when you lose your luggage at the airport, Jesus crucified, teach me patience. Mm. Jesus crucified, teach me patience. Jesus, I trust in you. You see, that's the heart of our Franciscan vocation. Some communities like to focus on Jesus the teacher or Jesus the contemplative. Or Jesus, the missionary. But the whole heart of the Franciscan vocation is we try to live in it as it has been presented to us over the years as Jesus crucified. When you focus on Jesus crucified, everything else falls into place. You don't have to say much either. If that's God on the cross, tell me, what else is there in this world? And if that is God on the cross, that just have to be repeated and represented till the end of time. And it is by his intention, his invention, his creativity in the holy sacrifice of the mass. 
to tide us over from the time of the ascension to the Father until he comes again in glory for judgment for each one of us at the moment of death. The best prayer, of course, though, is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. I remember the first question my mother would ask me in the morning, we'd come down for breakfast. Did you say your morning prayer? And there was a sacred heart enthroned in our kitchen. It wasn't one of those mild sacred hearts of Jesus pointing to his heart or inviting us to come. Oh, no. This sacred heart had probably the German interpretation. The finger of the Lord was extended as though an admonition. Mom used to use that for reinforcement for us. <laughs> that was so good. Because he's a just God. Sure, he's a merciful God. He's just everything. The last question at night, though, after we said our night prayers and got organized for bed, and the boys were always up on the third floor. There were five of us up there, and the girls were all on the second floor. It was a big house with a ten-room house, four bathrooms. My dad had to put in two extra ones, too, to accommodate these girls who had to put so much together when they got fixed up for where they were going. The last question at night was, did you brush your teeth? And I think that was a good admonition, too. Yes, they blended beautifully, the natural with the supernatural. Yeah, Mom knew how to relax. Thank you, Father. Very beautiful. I, I heard, uh, especially in your testimony, so many names. And I find that such a beautiful testimony of how the Lord works through so many individuals who are open to His will. Mother Teresa always said, pray, Father, that we may not spoil God's work. He wants to do so many beautiful things through us. And thank you for the beautiful ways you have allowed him to work through you. I'm edified and inspired by all that I heard in this past hour, and we're grateful to be able to share in how the Lord has been working in your life and continues to work in your life as an octo friar in these last years. I wonder, Father, could you give us a blessing as we conclude? This is the blessing of St. Francis, taken from the book of Numbers in the Hebrew Scriptures. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he show his face to you and have mercy on you. May he turn his countenance to you and give you peace. May the Lord bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I beseech thee, my Lord Jesus Christ, that the fiery and sweet strength of thy love may absorb our souls from all things under heaven that we may die for love of thy love, as thou didst deign to die for love of our love. Amen. Amen.